Happy week of Halloween, everybody. Well, it's that time of year again. Time for a new haunted house attraction. Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure how this became my go-to thing, but horror games like them some haunted houses, so why not? Let's embrace it. But what's better than just one haunted house? Why, how about an entire procedural haunted house attraction generator? Because for the Halloween of 2021, I'm going to be biting right into the horror-themed detective ghost hunter mystery game, Phasmophobia. Join me for a closer look and stay tuned to the end, where I'll try to clip the best moments of our game time for your entertainment. Check it out. Greetings, everyone. Okay. This is the Hipster Snack, and today we'll be looking at the indie 2020 sensation, the ghost hunting co-op horror title Phasmophobia. Developed by UK-based Kinetic Games, they wanted to create a realistic and immersive experience, which is why the VR and non-VR playstyles can play together in the same instance regardless of your setup. With a few very simple meta touches to know how some of the mechanics behave, you have a deeply engrossing experience on your hands. You take the role of professional ghost hunter, like on those TV shows, except in this universe, ghosts are actually real. And you and up to three friends can join in on the task of hunting down said ghosts and collecting the necessary evidence to identify the family of ghosts that it belongs to for the sake of a future team coming to follow up on your efforts in order to presumably exercise them. Cute jokes about me doing Ghost Hunter Core next year hereabouts. Anyway, let's get into it. Graphically, the game is great. And the choice to keep things as realistic as possible really has a lot of side effects. Presumably the very much intended effect of making you acutely aware of just how dire the situation is. Because it's realistic, you don't have the benefit of assuming you can just be at ease. The houses and buildings you explore are lovingly crafted to look like they were once lived in or at least used, giving a sort of implied storyline of events that transpired in each. And it makes it all the more hair-raising when that realistically rendered candle is hurled across a room by a moody poltergeist, or when a ghost event triggers and you're face to face with a violent apparition wielding a scythe and you can loudly hear your own heartbeat in your headphones. Actually, let's take a moment to talk about the sound design here, because unlike most games, this one goes two ways. The sound design is devilish in its execution, because the first thing you hear in any mission is a pleasant-sounding fellow who gives you a brief overview of your situation and some basic starting instructions about checking your whiteboard, more on that in a moment, and grabbing whatever gear you want to bring with you. Once you're across the threshold, the deafening silence is replaced by an ambient hum which hovers over you, provided you're in the ghost's territory. Don't worry, being outdoors and in the van are safe zones and it really does heighten the tension in its own subtle way. Coupled with paranormal sounds like ghostly footsteps or items being hurled across the room, the periodic moment where your own teammates accidentally spook you, the sound design is just out of this world. What really sells this is not only do you need a mic to play, the ghosts listen just as much as your teammates do. One of the newest additions, for example, the yokai, will become more aggressive if it can hear the player talking more than necessary. But another thing is that you have a local area push to talk and also a radio push to talk option. The game uses proximity chat with the former and a certain ghostly activity can interfere with the latter. Plus, one of the primary evidence gathering tools, the spirit box, is utilized by asking simple questions like, are you there, to get evidence from the more talkative among the spirit world. I'm not actually sure as of the latest, as of this writing, Major Update 3.0, if you need to use a push to talk key to use it or not, but it seems to help me if I do, so yeah. However, as said, the ghost listens for you, even if you aren't using one of these keys. So the best thing to do when you're in danger is to rein in your instincts and go silent. If your friends can't help themselves and start screaming at the top of their lungs, well, on the upside, odds are good that the ghost will zero in on them, and with any luck, you can resume your investigation as soon as they're all at room temperature. Devilishly profound and clever use of meta-mechanics to keep your players on their toes. Alright, let's dig into the next juicy bit, how the game actually plays. As said, you can venture out solo or in groups of up to four players max. You'll begin in a meeting lobby with the store and options laid out on the board in front, and the most recent photographs taken in missions in the back. Also, a basketball hoop. You will always be issued a loadout of standard issue equipment, so even if you're as bad at this game as I am, you will never be put into a position where the game becomes unwinnable. You can spend the money earned on missions for additional gear, which can get you extra copies like flashlights, which don't come cheap, 
and extra tools that have added benefits like using piles of salt to get additional information and evidence photographs. There is a full loadout you can have, but until you're rolling in the money, playing carefully and grinding out safer missions is not such a bad game plan. Anyway, once you're happy with your gear loadout, you pick a mission. These are randomly created and offered, though you should always have a variety of options. Things like street houses tend to be smaller and therefore easier to investigate, whereas things like the high school and asylum maps are much, much bigger, and therefore larger parties are recommended. Not that you can't do these solo, just a general rule of thumb, and the game will tell you what the recommended party size is for each. Also, very important, there's also difficulty settings. Amateur, where I currently spend most of my time because I suck at this game, then intermediate, which is precisely what it sounds like, and then professional difficulty for people who enjoy constantly wondering if the ghost is going to go ahead and hunt on that particular frame. You'll arrive on the scene in your van, gear on the shelves, and access to a certain number of closed-circuit video cameras depending on the size of the map. And you both collect the door key and check the whiteboard for information to get you on your way and what side missions you can undertake for additional cash. Remember, this is our day job now, so we want to know what methods we can use to make as much money as possible, and also as safely as possible. Don't be discouraged if one subtask or the other can't be done, like it wants you to have a ghost step in salt, but you didn't think to bring any that time. That's perfectly fine, just go and do what you can. The primary objective is to ID the type of ghost that you're dealing with, the secondary is whiteboard missions, and tertiary is taking three star photos of ghost evidence, like dirty water in sinks, or some other evidence tools like the Ouija board or ghost writing in the book item. Oh, speaking of, you can carry up to three items on your person at any one time, one of which will almost certainly always be a flashlight because common sense. You'll then take some tools often seen on those lame ghost hunting television shows that never actually find anything, and set out to do what no amount of video editing can, find the actual ghost. My personal favorites are the spirit voice box and the EMF reader, since both require you to be the biggest agitator you can be in order to get any results. And since every encounter with each ghost will be different, let me try to break down the different hows and whys. In no particular order, the spirit box will allow you to ask the ghost simple questions. Typically, you must have the lights off and be in the ghost's favored room, and the ghost must be the sort of ghost who actually answers questions on the spirit box evidence type. This can be a good tool to eliminate a lot of the possible 16 options right out of the gate and ID a ghost room with a little persistence. Next is the ghost writing book, which you will want to set in the ghost's room for them to express themselves artistically, either by drawing happy little runes or in real-time live journal updates. And that joke just dated me, didn't it? Hmm, never mind. The photo camera, while never used as conclusive evidence to ID a ghost type, can be used as a great moneymaker, either by shooting pics of other evidence or paranormal events. Or take close-up shots of your teammates if they get themselves killed, because yes, that gets you money after the fact. I have an entire deadly kitten portfolio, because when it comes to being scared, she tends to scream, and I don't. The EMF reader is probably the most misunderstood tool of the game. It's a device that picks up electromagnetic frequencies, hence EMF and some ghosts and ghost activity will cause it to register. However, it's vital to bear in mind that it won't be counted as evidence unless it hits EMF level 5. Anything less than that is not good enough for it to be officially considered that evidence type, but can satisfy the prereqs for some other submissions. And next is the video camera, which sounds simple enough, but it's probably one of the most useful tools once you've narrowed down the ghost's room. You can set it up, flee at top speed to the van, and watch the feed from the safety and comfort of your mobile base of operations. Not only can this check for spirit orbs, but can also catch sight of other evidence coming to light. For example, a popular strategy is to set up a spirit writing book in sight of a video camera, allowing you to check for both evidence types in peace. UV flashlights and glow sticks can help check for fingerprints, which are a type of evidence, and footprints, which are not. Enough said. The newest tool, the dots projector, can show the silhouette of a ghost that walks into its field. I haven't gotten to play with this very much as of this writing, so Hopefully I have something worthwhile to show when I actually get around to recording the footage for this episode. Candles do what you might very well expect, but due to a new quirk in the game's ghost hunt AI, can be a safe alternative if you don't want the ghost's hunting abilities to accidentally make your gear signal where you are at an inopportune moment, but still want a light. The cross can be set in a ghost's room and prevent up the two of its fatal hunting routines before it essentially gets turned into liquid metal, and is particularly useful against banshee-type ghosts. By the way, this is a cross, not a crucifix. A crucifix still has the effigy of Christ on it, and this doesn't, so this is just a cross. Alright, setting that aside, smudge sticks can be set alight via lighter or lit candle, 
and will stall ghost hunts, and if used as preventative measures, can also delay a hunt from getting underway in the first place, varies a little bit by ghost type. Motion sensors were worthless before, but now have been combined with infrared scanners, and now can be used to track paranormal activity, particularly useful in larger maps. Parabolic mics can be used to pick up paranormal sounds from a great distance away, and like the previous item mentioned, they don't suck anymore. Salt can be dumped on the floor for photo evidence and protection from one type of ghost. You know, the more I describe the asterisks found on these hunts, the more I sound like the phone guy in FNAF 2. Anyway, the most powerful item in the game are sanity pills, which are a medicine which, through means rather unclear, restore plus 40% of the player's depleted sanity, though the total can never go over 100%. These are practically essential on the biggest maps in the game. Lastly, the thermometer does what you might expect and checks room temperature, as some ghosts naturally cause the environment around them to cool. This counts as evidence if it dips below freezing, which is below 0 Celsius or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are other tools, but they aren't as essential to your survival as these are, because you see, every ghost will have three evidence types tied to it, and your mission is to use both the hard evidence types and also the ghost's native behavior patterns to identify what kind of enemy you're up against. Once you ID the ghost, you can choose to carry on the investigation for the submissions and photo optionals, or fall back at any time, as getting the positive identification is technically the primary goal. Now, let's talk about that sanity mechanic I brought up before, because it's stated in story that ghosts passively feed on the mental well-being of the living, causing a rapid deterioration of sanity and even the strongest of wills. I actually like this as an explanation, as it makes more sense than just assuming that everyone's afraid of the same thing. That said, being in the dark, witnessing ghost events, and certain ghost abilities can erode your sanity away, leaving you in greater and greater subsequent risk of being attacked by way of ghost hunts. When the ghost goes on the hunt, you have a couple of seconds to realize what's going on and either hide or haul butt as far away from them as possible, depending both on the level layout and the ghost type in question. If all you can do is duck behind a couch or stand behind the door, then do it. It's better than standing out in the open like an idiot and awaiting inevitability. Ghosts will hunt more frequently as the player's average sanity decreases, the game treating average as being the players currently in the ghost's active area, so people hiding in the van can't tilt the number advantage for you. And some, like the demon, mare, banshee, or yokai, can even attack very early on in an investigation if certain, sometimes mundane, criteria are met. So a hearty awareness of your environment is key. Because the ghosts can hear you, you should give them something to listen to, Phrases like give us a sign or show yourself can provoke activity, as can using their names. However, this does also make them more restless and could provoke a hunt, so you walk a fine line by going this avenue. Once you decide you have enough evidence or all your teammates are dead and making a wild guess will save you more time and money than the party wipe, you return to your van, enter evidence into your journal, and press the keypad to pack it all in. At the end, you'll be shown your mission status and rewarded with cash depending on how well you did, versus the difficulty multiplier and depending on how risky you set the mission to be. Whereupon you can purchase new gear and resume your ghost hunting duties accordingly. And in case you haven't figured it out by now, I love Phasmophobia. It's a game that remains tense and scary even when you have a robust understanding of its underlying mechanics. It's the right amount of haunting atmosphere, with great risk-reward balance and interesting mechanics that make it more of a detective or puzzle game that happens to have horror trappings, rather than an outright horror game with some investigating that needs to be done. Consider the random nature of the ghosts and straightforward use of evidence-gathering tools, it makes for a great experience which can be enjoyed to the fullest no matter how many hours you sink into it. It's great, it's still terrifying, alone or with friends. So get the game together and split up to look for clues, talking dogs are optional. This has been the Haunted Snack, checking out haunted houses for their ghostly owners for your entertainment today. Special thanks for Deadly Kitten for assisting in getting the footage for today's episode and being good sports about my ribbing them endlessly during our gameplay sessions. If you liked what you saw today, hit that like button, and to be continuously haunted by my recurring presence, there's always the subscribe and bell icon. Okay, I've run this ghost thing into the ground pretty firmly by now, but expect more Let's Plays, game reviews, snack tech, and more right here every week. And I will see you there. I thought I saw orbs in the basement, but I'm not sure. Are you in here? 
I just apologize to anyone listening to this has to deal with the static of the spirit box. I don't like it either. Are you in here? Did you copy? He's a talker. I got him to respond in the green room upstairs. Okay, are you hearing me though? I hear you fine. Just that kind of caught me off guard. You want to be buddies? Alright, I am just seeing you on the... The book flew... Hi. The book flew off the bed. Yeah, that's not all that happened. What else happened? He literally appeared right in front of me and menaced me with a knife. What did you say you're trying next? I just set up the dots and I moved the camera so that we can see the book and the better part of the room a little bit better. Alright, go to the truck. right on top of me. I had no time. I should have run further. I shouldn't have gone for the nearest closet. I can't hear anything you're saying. That's because I'm dead, so, I mean, it's not like it matters. You ever write in that book? Ah, uh, and of course I die in a really undignified pose. That's just my luck. Well, that sucks. I hope she figures out that I'm dead. Do you want to start over? Mm, looks like you're not going to get a choice in the matter. Come on, dude, wait for me. Well, we tried. I wonder what type of ghost it was. <laughs> 